In this video, we're going to cover CRISPR-Cas9 screening. So to start, I just want to give a quick overview of any large-scale screening general sort of process overview. So usually you're going to start with some sort of question. For example, our question might be, what genes cause resistance to chemotherapy and glioma, right? So we want to know out of all of the genes in the whole genome, which is 17,000 genes, slightly more than 17,000 genes actually, what genes associate with resistance. So as our first thing we're going to do, we're going to sort of interrogate across the whole genome. Okay, so we can do the whole genome, we can do a large part of the genome, but the point is that at least on the order of thousands of genes, we're going to be looking for the genes that matter. From that, we're going to be able to identify some significant targets or pathways that we're interested in. And then we'll move on from those targets to choosing a few genes. So we might have hundreds of targets. We're going to go from hundreds to about one to 10 genes that we're really interested in validating in the lab. And as a final piece of any really high impact good project, we're going to want to identify a mechanism behind that gene. So let's start with a simple overview of CRISPR-Cas9. So here I want to cover what CRISPR-Cas9 does, how it works, why it's so important, and what are some of the potential applications with CRISPR-Cas9. So first, let's talk about what it is. So CRISPR-Cas9, this technology together, allows extremely specific and very efficient, so very quick, gene editing of cells. And what it's composed of is two main pieces. It's composed of a Cas9 enzyme, which is basically what allows it to cut, and a guide RNA that targets it to the genomic location. So if I say that I want to make a cut right at this piece of DNA, and then make a modification, my Cas9 is what will cut, and the guide RNA is what will target the Cas9 to that correct location and make sure that it actually cuts in that location and works in that location. At that point, the cell is going to try to repair the genome cut, and so it will repair, and it will usually repair it incorrectly, and so that will cause a premature stop codon, and it will result in a knockout of the gene. This is a complete knockout. It can also use a defined sequence to add in something else. And so now we have an edited gene, which is also possible with CRISPR-Cas9. So I want to take a quick second to talk about modifying gene expression in general. So I just told you that CRISPR is a highly efficient way to do gene knockout. So I want to draw this distinction between knockouts and knockdowns. So a gene knockout is a DNA level modification. So you're acting on your actual DNA. And you remember that DNA is the main code for everything that happens in the cell. So you're acting right directly on the main source of all of the information in the cell. And you're making a modification of that so that the gene cannot be expressed. Or alternatively, so that you make a permanent alteration to the gene. It could be either. But here we're talking about a knockout, which is why I said cannot be expressed. And so like we talked about, CRISPR-Cas9 is sort of the prototype system for that now. And what it uses is a guide RNA, otherwise known as an SG RNA, and a Cas9. Alternatively, we can do what's called a knockdown. And so this is a little bit different because it acts at the RNA level. So we talked before about how DNA is translated to RNA, which is translated to protein. And our ultimate goal with both of these is to nix the protein because we don't want whatever that gene is to actually be expressed and to be able to do something. So we can interfere at the DNA level, that's what a knockout would be, or we can intervene at the RNA level and that's a knockdown. And so here we're making a modification at the RNA level and that's gonna promote degradation of the RNA and therefore it halts translation so we get no protein. So here you can see that you have an RNAi, which is an interference RNA that you've put in. It interacts with your mRNA and it results in degraded RNA so that, again, you get no protein. And this uses either shRNA or siRNA. So it's really important to keep these straight, so you know, which is which. So I always think of sgRNA, just think of it as a guide because CRISPR needs a guide. The genome's really large and CRISPR needs a guide to figure out where to go, and so that's going to be your SGRNA. And then the interference systems are SH or SI, 
Okay, so let's talk now about some of the implications of CRISPR-Cas9. So this is a nice schematic that I got, and you can see that when you think about biological implications, this means that we can easily edit genes, we could change the regulation, we could edit the epigenetic, epigenome editing is what it's called. We can do different types of imaging, as you can see here. We can target RNAs better. So it opens up a host of different opportunities because it's so efficient and so easy to do compared to previous ways of gene editing. Think about the broader industrial implications of it. You know, we've talked a lot about the medicine and genetic implications of it, which is sort of this piece, but it's also something we can use to make fuel more efficient, to make better food, to work on materials, potentially to edit genes in a really uh, focused way to develop new therapies for genetic diseases or to develop new drugs. So it really has a lot of possibilities, a lot of implications. It's a really amazing technology and there's a lot we can do with it. Today we're really just going to talk about screens, but I want you to be aware that CRISPR-Cas9 is a really versatile tool and you can do a lot of things. Alright, so now that we've talked a little about CRISPR, let's take a minute to talk about gene modification in the lab. So this is sort of a step out. I'm just going to talk about gene modification in general before getting deeper into CRISPR because I want to make sure that you understand how we actually modify genes. And that will explain better how we can use CRISPR in the lab to modify genes as well. Okay, so let's start by talking about plasmids. Plasmids are your basic unit for how you can modify gene expression in the lab. Anytime you want to modify gene expression, you need to have a plasmid, okay? A plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA that can be used to change gene expression and that gets replicated within the system. Typically, plasmids are used in two systems. We use them in bacteria to expand them and in mammals to actually make our gene modification. And so a good plasmid has to have components of both of them. It has to be able to grow in both systems. So why is that? So our plasmid, this is our plasmid, and the way we grow up our plasmid, because we only have, let's say, one plasmid right now, when we buy it from the company, we only get one plasmid, but we need like a million plasmids to be able to do our experiments. And so we wanna expand this plasmid. So what we do is we put the plasmid in a bacterial cell. So this is your bacteria and this is your plasmid. And we're going to use this, we're gonna multiply the bacteria. And because the plasmid gets multiplied as well, now we'll end up with a million plasmids at the end. So this is why the plasmid has to be able to survive in bacteria because bacteria are sort of our factory for making multiple plasmids out of one plasmid. And then of course it has to be able to survive in a mammalian system because this is where we're actually making our gene modification. So let's go through the pieces a little bit. So this origin of replication is going to be the bacterial origin of replication. It's what allows this plasmid to be replicated in bacteria. And this resistance gene here, which could be ampicillin, is what allows us to select for the plasmid in the bacteria. So typically when you grow it in bacteria, you'll add ampicillin to make sure that you're only growing bacteria that contain your plasmid and not growing any other bacteria. And then the rest of the system is going to be your mammalian system. So you have your promoter here that allows, this is sometimes CMV, sometimes SV40. This allows growth of the plasmid in, or sorry, this allows expression of your gene in a mammalian system. Then you have whatever you've inserted. So this could be your guide RNA, it could be your SH RNA, it could be an SI RNA. It could also just be a fluorescent gene like GFP or RFP that you might have added in, so any gene that you're interested in. And then this here is your selectable marker for the mammalian system. So in the same way that you want to select the cells that have your plasmid in the bacteria, you want to be able to do the same thing in the animal cells. And so we use pyromycin, for example, which is an antibiotic that works against mammalian cells and it allows us to select which cells actually have our um, have our plasmid in them, so we can be sure that we're using transformed cells. All right, so when you want to create a plasmid, there's a few there's a few options for getting a plasmid. One is to clone it by yourself in the lab.
This kind of gives you an overview of how you might clone, but the basic idea is that you have some sort of backbone plasmid. So this is your backbone that has most of the pieces you need. So for example, this might already have your ampicillin, it might already have the puromycin, and all you need to add is your gene of interest. So this is your gene that you wanna add. This could again be RFP, it could be GFP, it could be an sgRNA. The point is it has that piece that you're interested in adding on. So you make a cut, so here you can see your cuts, and these have the same cuts, and then you sort of stick them together using a ligase, which is a ligation enzyme. And when you do this, you end up with a complete plasmid that has all of your different parts. And now you're gonna put it in bacteria, as we talked about before, in order to expand it. And then you're gonna get all of your bacterial colonies that contain your plasmid. So this is very commonly done in a lot of molecular biology labs, and it allows you to generate any plasmid that you're interested in studying. That said, there are also multiple repositories of plasmids. So for example, AdGene is a great plasmid repository where you can get millions of plasmids um, that other labs have uploaded that they've already developed. And so sometimes that is your best bet for getting a plasmid you're interested in. There are also lots of companies that make plasmids, so if you're interested in a particular gene, you can just order the plasmid that expresses that gene, and you don't have to clone all of them in the lab. So when you do that, you're going to get a glycerol stock of the plasmid. A glycerol stock is just a bacterial stock, so it contains the bacteria which contain your plasmid of interest. You're then going to grow your bacteria up overnight in LB, plus the antibiotic, which we talked about is being ampicillin, Usually it can also be canamycin, sometimes neomycin, some sort of bacteria, some sort of antibiotic that allows you to select for your plasmid of interest. And so this is an example of what your bacteria might look like. You have your bacterial DNA, you have your plasmid DNA, and all of this DNA is going to get replicated into every single bacteria that grows in this dish. And then the next morning, you'll use a kit to purify the plasmids from your bacteria and then you'll have X1 million plasmids compared to what you started with, which should be sufficient for you to do your experiment. Okay, so now that we've talked about plasmids, let's talk about how we actually use them in the lab. So plasmid transfection. So transfection, transfection is a transient modification. So it's very simple. It can be done on almost any cell line but it's transient. It's only going to last approximately three to seven days. That's a big limitation of doing transfections. And a transfection is really simple. All you're doing is you take your plasmid DNA, so this is the plasmid that we just talked about. You take any transfection region, it doesn't have to be this one. This is just a picture from the company, but it can be any transfection region that you use according to the specifications. You mix them together to create these little um, liposomes that um, you need to incubate for about 20 minutes and then you add that onto your cells. So you just have a dish of cells you've already plated and all you do is you throw this complex in there and after about one to three days you should see that your cells have been transformed but again this will only last three to seven days so it's very important to get your experiment done. This is great for short-term experiments, sort of quick modifications. You just want to make a modification, see what it does, and then you're done with the experiment. However, a lot of the time, we want to actually keep our cells for a long time, and we want to make a permanent modification that lasts a long time so we can do multiple experiments with the cells. So in these cases, we want to do what's called a transduction. So this is a lentiviral transduction. This is meant to be a permanent modification to the cells in such a way that we can modify them and then save them and keep using them knowing that our modification is not going to disappear. So the way you do this is by first doing a transfection. So you start by transfecting your X293 cells is a special cell line that allows for a production of virus. And you start with what we just talked about. So you do a simple transfection with your DNA and your transfection reagent. You add that onto your cells and you add three plasmids. So one is your plasmid of interest, just like we did in the transfection, and two of them are actually viral plasmids that allow the cell to construct the viral envelope and the genome. And then 
you wait about 40 to 72 hours and the cells will produce viral particles in the media. So then you can harvest the virus by taking the media off of the cells because it's been released into the media. And we can add that onto our cells of interest. So let's say that I'm interested in transforming U251 cells. Then this plate would contain U251 cells and I would add the virus media on top of it in order to generate transformed U251 cells. And once you spin these together, you wait about one to three days. You can do a selection with pyromycin if you would like, and you end up with the transduced selected cells. This is your pure population of modified cells. You can save these and it should be a permanent change. As you can see, this takes a little more time up front. It's not as easy to do, but it does produce a permanent modification, which can be very useful for a lot of applications. This is just another figure going over that. So these are our three plasmids that we're using. These are three different pieces of the virus. Together, they form one viral particle, which then gets put into the media. So this is our media, as you can see. And then those viral particles in the media can be used to add to other cells. So for example, our U251 cell. So this could be our U251 cell, and this is our 293 cell. And now it's able to actually go ahead and modify the genome, a permanent modification. This will get passed on with every single passage of the cells. And so now we have a permanent modification and we can use these cells for any other experiment we would like to. Okay, so now that we've talked a little about our transfection and transduction, I just wanna highlight a few key points that are important to think about. So one is understanding MOI. MOI stands for multiplicity of infection, and it's basically a ratio of how many virus particles you're adding in as compared to cells. So in our example, if I'm transducing U251 cells, I need to add in enough virus particles to actually effectively transduce the cells. And the way we define that is an MOI. MOIs usually have to be figured out in the lab, depending on the cell line and the virus you're working with. They tend to change from line to line. But in general, a good MOI can be anywhere between 1 and 20 to be effective. Some cells are particularly hard to infect and take 50, even 100 MOI, but most cells will fall somewhere in this range. So just to explain a little bit better, you can imagine it's just a ratio. So if we have two cells and one virus, we have an MOI of 0 0.5. Whereas if we have one cell and three viruses, it's an MOI of three. So it's your virus over your cells. And it's an important number for knowing um, how to be consistent experiment to experiment because you wanna make sure that you're always using the same amount of virus your experiments are controlled. The other thing to keep in mind is the antibiotic selection. So most plasmids will have a section that is the antibiotic selection piece. And like we talked about, this could be pyromycin for mammalian cells. And here you can see that we have infected, so let's say this is our U251 population and we've transduced them. But there are still some cells, these gray cells, that did not get transduced with virus. And so we can select out those gray cells with pyromycin, and now we have a pure population of cells that have been transduced. This is really nice to do because you want to make sure that you have as complete of a transformation as possible so that the cells that you're working with, once you save them and make them, you know that all of the cells have the modification you're interested in. And the other thing that's useful in these plasmids is having a fluorescence marker. So even though we have our antibiotic selection and if we select with the antibiotic, we think that all of our cells probably have the modification we're interested in, it's still nice to have a visual readout. And so a lot of plasmids will also include a visual readout. So on top of having your gene, they'll have right next to it, driven by the same promoter. So if this is your promoter, the gene and the fluorescence gene are both in front of the promoter. So if your gene is being expressed, the fluorescence gene is also being expressed. And this is really nice for allowing you to see and actually visualize under a microscope what percent of your cells are infected. So what percent of your cells did you successfully transduce? Um, and you can figure that out, of course, by doing your pyromycin and selecting and seeing how many cells die. But this is a really nice visualization right away of how many cells were infected. So 
Plasmids almost always have your antibiotic markers, but sometimes they'll also have fluorescence, and sometimes you can choose that when you're buying them, and so it's just like very nice to have so you can see your efficiency. Okay, so now let's delve really into the CRISPR-Cas9 screen now that we've covered all our basics. So just to remind you all of the basics, CRISPR-Cas9 is our gene editing tool. And we use it in the same way that we use any plasmid. So it comes as a plasmid. It's an sgRNA plasmid. We have to make virus out of it in the same way. So you take your plasmid that is an sgRNA and you make virus out of it, and then you infect the cells at a defined MOI, and then you look at your output. So it's kind of the same workflow, which is why I wanted to go over that workflow. Okay, so let's start by talking about our screen setup. So watch this multiple times if you have to. CRISPR-Cas9 screening is pretty complicated. It's hard to understand the very first time around, but this is just sort of a bare bones overview based on this figure from a nature paper um, of how a screen actually works. So let's start by talking about the plasmid library. So CRISPR-Cas9, like we talked about, is a bunch of plasmids that's how you make your modification. So just like any modification you're making, you're going to have a bunch of plasmids in this CRISPR-Cas9 library that allow you to make modifications. This library will have thousands of constructs and that allows you to make thousands of modifications. So it's a library, so instead of doing just one plasmid and getting one modification, you're doing 77,000 plasmids, and you're getting 77,000 modifications out of it. From your plasmids, you're going to make virus, as we already talked about, and so now instead of having a plasmid library, you have a viral library, but it's the same stuff, it has the same plasmids, it's going to make the same modifications. The virus is just how you're going to get it into the cells because you want to have a permanent change like we talked about before. So then you're going to infect your cells, and so this infection will be at an MLI of 0 0.3. This MLI is to ensure that you only get one plasmid or one virus for each cell. You don't wanna have two knockouts in one cell because that will mess up your screen later on. So you really wanna be sure that you only have one plasmid per cell. The MOI of 0.3 is something that has been determined to be the best MOI to make sure that happens and still get a good efficiency of transduction in your population. The cells, just to go back for a second and talk about the cells, you have to choose a cell line that is ideally immortalized. We'll talk about why this is a little bit later in the presentation, but you really want cells that are easy to infect and easy to work with because this is quite a long process and requires quite a lot of cells. You will add Cas9 to these cells, again in lentiviral form, because you need, remember CRISPR requires two things, so you need your Cas9 and your sgRNA. You get your sgRNA from the library, but you have to make sure that the cells already have Cas9. So this cell line now has Cas9 in it, so now we can use it to infect. And so we add our sgRNA library and our Cas9 into this, and we end up with this population of cells. Now you'll notice that some of these cells actually don't have a library construct in them. And so we want to make sure to select those out. So this is going to be the pyromycin selection that we've already talked about. And that pyromycin will allow you to nix all of these cells and only keep the pure library population that still has a guide in it. So every cell should have a guide in it. And you don't want any cells that don't have guides in them because that will again mess up your screen. So now we have a screening population. And this population is a population of cells that contains our entire library. And so if you want to do multiple screens, it's really important that you save this population and hold on to it. Because this is your day zero population that has every single guide, every single knockout. And so any screen you do, you're going to want to start with these cells. From these cells that are a perfect population, we can go ahead and do any conditions we want. So these would be our conditions. You have some control, some treatment group, some sort of something that we expose it to, which we can talk about later, for some amount of days, which again depends on your screen. 
And once that is done, you're gonna send it for PCR to amplify the genes and then for sequencing in order to see how your library performed after the condition that you applied it to. So we'll talk a little more about this piece in a second, but first and foremost, it's important to understand the setup. So you need a library, you need cells, and you need a low MOI infection, and then you need to select to make sure that you have a pure population where every single cell has only one guide. And after that, you can expose to treatments and we can talk about the analysis. All right, so now let's talk for a second about how we choose the library and how we choose the cells. So a library is just a collection of constructs. When I say constructs, I mean sgRNA plasmids. And each plasmid targets a certain gene. So it can be whatever group of genes that you are interested in. It could be the entire genome. It could be a specific set of genes, but it's always going to be library implies a large collection, whatever it is. So where do these come from? You can get them from AdGene. AdGene sells a few libraries that are very well validated. You can also make them in the lab yourself. This will be a little harder because it's less well validated, but sometimes if you want a specific subset, it's the way to go. You have to think about what kind of library you want. So do you want a knockout library where every single construct knocks out a certain gene? Do you want an activation library or do you want a gene repression library? So it's more to think about what kind of screen you're doing. You also wanna think about whether you wanna cover the whole genome or some sort of subset. For example, you could do all kinases or all growth factors, or you can do just the entire genome and get every single known gene. You wanna think about the species that you're gonna do this in. So this should match the cell species that you're interested in and your disease species. And then you want to know how many guides per gene you're going to get. So if you buy a library, it almost always has four to eight guides per gene. And this is to allow to have replicates because you don't want to do just one knockout. If you did just one knockout for every single gene, that knockout might show an effect, but that effect might not be real. It might just be an artifact of the guide. The guide might be mistargeted. There might be something wrong. So having four to eight knockouts allows you to see if that knockout is actually doing something that's real. So if all four knockouts, or at least three out of four knockouts, show an effect, then you know that it's real. So that's important. Okay, then let's talk about the cells. So like I said before, screens require really large numbers of immortalized cells. So it's hard to use PDX lines for these screens because you can't passage them as long as you need to be able to. So cells like SMB19, U251, those kinds of cells are really good for these screens. And what you're gonna do is you're going to, like we talked about, infect the cells with the virus. So here you have transduced cells. You're gonna select them and you're gonna save this population as your library population. And then you're gonna expand. So you need 100 million cells minimum to do a CRISPR screen. 100 million cells per condition. This is a lot of cells. For reference, one normal 10 centimeter plate that we use in the lab has only a million cells in it. So this is 110 centimeter plates. So it's a lot of cells. And that's why it's nice to have an immortalized cell line that's easy to work with because it's very easy to lose the cells or to have them crash on you while you're screening. And then the screen usually lasts 14 to 21 days. So these cells not only have to be able to be infected and expand to 100 million, but then they have to go through the entire screen as well. Okay, so now let's take a deeper look at what's actually going on in the screen. So this is the part that I told you we would come back to. So we have our screening population of cells, right? We've expanded it to 100 million cells, and now we're ready to screen. So we're gonna do two conditions. This is condition A, this is condition B, and then we're gonna send the cells for sequencing. So this is this part, the growth part, what's going on in here. So this is a very small scale example. I've sort of brought it down to be just six cells, two genes, to try to understand what is actually going on. And then, 
In real life, of course, our scale is about 77,000 guys, which corresponds to 19,000 genes. And it's in 100 million cells, and we obviously cannot see what is happening. So even though I'm showing you the DNA level changes here, in reality, we just passage the cells, we expose them to treatment, and we send everything to sequencing. And until we get the sequencing results, we really don't know what happened. So it's very important, as you can imagine, to be really careful because you're passaging so many cells and you're spending so much money passaging those cells and sending it to sequencing, you wanna make sure that you're really, really careful with your screen because you can't see what's going on inside the screen. So for our example, so this is gonna be our small scale example. We got a library from AdGene. This is AdGene. We got a library from AdGene and this library was a library for just two genes, so gene A and gene B and we have one guide for each gene, okay? So we made our virus, we infected our cells, we selected our cells, and now this is our population. So this is our day zero population where every single group of cells, so we have six cells, has the same number of each guide. So we have two guides, we have six cells, so we're gonna have three guides for every single, three, three cells that have every single guide in them, okay? So since we have gene A and gene B, we're gonna have three cells that have gene A and three cells that have gene B. And then we're gonna do our screen. So we're just gonna treat the cells for a few weeks or grow them or do whatever. You know, We're gonna expose them to some condition that we're interested in. And at the end of it, we're gonna have an altered distribution. So some of the guides are gonna make modifications that allow the cells to grow really well. And some of the guides are gonna result in cell death. So here we can see that our purple guide went up a ton, but our blue guide went down. So this is what's going on in the screen. What we actually see is the sequencing. So once we're done, we send our day zero and our day XX, whatever it happened to be, to sequencing. And that spits out a FASTQ file. This FASTQ file can be converted to a table format. There are multiple different sources available to do this. You can write your own code, you can use one of the online platforms, but you need to be able to convert this FASTQ to a table. And when you convert it to a table, it's gonna give you the counts. So it's gonna tell you how many cells had guide one and how many cells had guide two, or sorry, how many cells had the guide for gene A and how many cells had the guide for gene B at day zero versus your final day of your screen. And we know that it should have the same number when we sent it because we just infected the cells. We infected every cell with the same amount of each guide. So we know that it should be three and three when we sent it. And then this is what we're gonna see. So this is what has changed. So now at the end of our screen, we have five of gene A and we only have one of gene B. So that means that compared to the beginning of our screen, gene A has been enriched and gene B has been depleted. So this table is really gonna tell you at the end, once you've done the entire screen and sent it for sequencing, at the end you find out how the guides have changed over time. And how the guides have changed over time is gonna tell you which genes matter in your screen. So this table, the next step is really to understand what we do with this table, how we analyze it. All right, so to better understand the setup and this analysis process. Like basically, we're trying to understand what are we doing with this table? To understand that better, let's walk through an example. So let's say that we wanna perform a CRISPR screen. This is gonna be a whole genome CRISPR screen to understand which genes drive growth of glioma stem cells. We're interested in glioma stem cells because as we talked about before, they are thought to drive the heterogeneity and the recurrence that we see in GBM. So in theory, if we could target these glioma stem cells, we would be able to stop this heterogeneity and this recurrence. Okay, so first let's talk about our setup. So this is gonna be kind of what we talked about before, but now we filled in all the details. So we have a whole genome library because I want to do a whole genome screen. I'm interested in knockouts because I want to see which gene can I knock out to cause death of the cells. And 77,000 constructs is just the standard number for a whole genome screen. We're gonna use immortalized GSCs 
And in this case, we could actually use multiple different cell lines. We could conduct this screen on, for example, 10 or 20 different cell lines to get a really good idea of what's going on. And we're going to infect the cells just like before, low MOI, select just like before. And now we're going to end up with this glioma stem cell library population that has all of our different interest in genes, all at the exact same frequency, okay? Then we're going to expose it to conditions. So our control is going to be the day zero because we want to see what genes were there at day zero. And as the cells grew in culture, so 28 days of growth, what cells dropped out over the period of that growth and what cells were enriched over the period of that growth. That's going to tell us which genes contributed to cell death and which genes contributed to cell viability. And then we're going to send it for sequencing at the end, like we've talked about. Okay, so now let's understand how we interpret this, because this is, this is really the hardest part of understanding a CRISPR screen is how do you interpret the screen? We send all of these different guides for sequencing and what does it all mean? So let's start by talking about normal tumor growth. So let's say that we have a regular tumor and we haven't done anything to the cells and so no modification whatsoever. We have like eight cells here and let's say this is seven days, the cells are gonna grow. They're gonna grow a normal amount, sort of their usual doubling time and then seven more days they're gonna grow even more. Now let's say that I took those cells and I knocked out a tumor suppressor. So let's say I knocked out P53, okay? So there's no more break. There's no more break on the growth. So now these cells are gonna grow even faster, right? Faster growth. And even here, even faster growth. So when I compare these two populations, I'm gonna have way more cells here. And because each of these cells contains a guide RNA, when I count my guides, I'm going to have enriched guides here. There's going to be way more guides for these cells because I knocked out a tumor suppressor and they're growing much, much faster. And so they're going to have be enriched in guides. So enriched guides means suppressor gene. Now let's imagine that I knocked out a driver gene. So this is a gene that allows growth. It's a gene that's really important for the cells to grow. And now it's gone. And so if this growth gene is gone, then the cells are gonna start dying and they're gonna keep dying. And so we're gonna have much fewer cells compared to the normal growth condition. And because we're gonna have much fewer cells, we're gonna see depletion of guides, right? Because the cell also contains a little guide RNA and now we're gonna see depletion of that guide in our table. So guides for driver genes or growth genes are going to be depleted over time. This is really important. So make sure that you understand this really well before moving on. It's a little bit confusing because it's sort of opposite of what you might think, but walk through the logic and make sure you understand it because you can you have to understand it to be able to interpret the screen. All right, so let's look at it another way. So this is sample data. These are our genes and our guides. So this is A1BG, this is A1CF, A2N, and so on. And as we talked about before, you have to have at least four guides per gene. So here we have four guides for each gene. And if we compare our replicates, we can see that, for example, A1BG is generally depleted. And it's depleted across all four. That's why it's important to have multiple guides. But you can see that this guide, for example, did not perform very well. It's kind of low across the board. And that's why you wanna have four replicates because having three other replicates allows us to see that there is a real effect even though that guide didn't really work. Like we could nix this guide because it's not really working. We see depletion for two other genes and we see that these two are enriched over time. So having replicates in both our conditions and in our guides is really important to be able to see that there's a true effect. So now we wanna know Let's review one more time. What do depletions and enrichments imply about the genes? So depleted genes, remember depleted genes is gonna be growth genes. These are genes that are important for growth and we knock them out. And because we knock them out, the cells died. And so the guides are depleted. Enriched genes are genes that are important for tumor suppression or 
important to kill the cells. So if these genes were normal, they would kill the cells. But since we knocked them out, we knocked out the suppressor, now they're growing in an uncontrolled fashion. And so we're getting enrichment of the guides. If we take our depletion and our enrichment, so we said depleted is blue here and enriched is red. Okay, so, and we expand this. So now, instead of it being five genes and one cell line, we're talking about 1,300 genes and 18 cell lines. So these are our genes here. This is 1,300 genes, and this is 18 different cell lines. This is from a paper in Cell that did some really impressive work looking at 18 different cell lines comparing glioma stem cells and neural stem cells in non-GBM cell lines to understand which genes are important for growth. It's really quite an undertaking to do this many cell lines for CRISPR screen. So if we expand what we talked about in the last table, then you can see that all of the blue genes are depleted and all of the red genes are enriched. And you can see distinct patterns. So the non-GBM cell lines have different patterns of genes that are enriched and different patterns of genes that are depleted over time. And so that just shows us this really just gives us a bird's eye view of the fact that there's very different gene expressions that are going on and different genes that are important for driving glioma versus non-glioma, which is actually really helpful because it tells us there are genes we can target that would specifically target glioma stem cells without targeting other cells. Okay, so let's say we have that giant heat map and we know which genes are depleted and which genes are enriched. That's great. But this is still 17,000 genes we're looking at. It's multiple conditions. So how do we get from this to knowing which genes are actually important for us to look at, which genes actually matter, and which genes are just genes that didn't change that much or didn't change significantly? So for now, I want you to think about this as a black box. So these are multiple algorithms that basically assign a score. So they take your condition one and your condition two and they give it a score and they give it a p-value. And they basically tell you it changed by this much and it's this significant of a change. And so you end up with this table after you run through this analysis, you end up with this table that basically just has each gene. It tells you a full change and it tells you a p-value. And this is really helpful because these are very well validated techniques. You don't really need to worry about how to figure out which genes are important. You just need to look at the full change in the p-value that they give you. And now you can use that to filter your genes. You can say, I want genes that are significant and I want genes that have changed quite dramatically. So at least a full change of two. And that can filter down your table to just you know a few genes that you're interested in looking at. For example, in this paper, they went from this big heat map to having just a few genes that were interested in looking at. In real life, when we do these screens, we take 17,000 genes or 19,000 genes. And usually doing this p-value full change will still give us a few hundred genes, so let's say 600 genes. And so this is where it becomes important to look at pathways, look at other patient data um, or other data sets to think about what you might be interested in actually pursuing and to further narrow it down to that one to 10 genes that you actually wanna study. So for this paper, this is what they eventually came up with. So they pooled all of their different conditions and from that they were able to identify a few genes that were specifically cancer fitness genes. This is a plot that shows basically their full change in p-value. And these are the genes that changed the most and were most significant and so the ones they're interested in looking at. And these are the pathways that were enriched. So anytime you do a large screen like this, it's really important to look at the pathways because screens like this give you that ability to see what are all the genes that are enriched or all the genes that are depleted and then see what pathways do all of those genes correspond to so you know that in general what pathways and programs is the cell upregulating, which also gives you a lot of insight into what the cell is doing. So for example, here, this is a screen looking at essential genes or genes that are important for growth. And you can see that it's upregulating things like DNA replication, cell cycle, it's upregulating biosynthesis, it's upregulating transport, 
And those are all things that make sense because a cell that's growing needs to do all of these things to continue growing. And so looking at pathways can be really helpful to identify genes that might be good targets and to also understand understand what's going on at a global level. And that's one of the big things the screen allows is to actually do that understanding, whereas just going after a few genes would never allow you to understand what's going on at a pathway level. All right, so this figure is just a summary figure, again, from this great nature paper describing their screen, but I think it gives a really good overview of how CRISPR screens work in general. So just, this is for review to make sure that you really understand what's going on. So one final walkthrough. We have our cell line of interest and we have a large library of constructs. We infect them at a low MLI and we select. And selecting for these transduced cells allows us to have a population that now we can use to screen. This population is what you want to save if you want to do more screens. We pick a certain number of days. For CRISPR screens, it can be anywhere between 7 and 28 days. And we do our treatments or conditions that we're interested in. We then extract the guides, extract the DNA from the cells. We amplify our guides because we're interested in the guides specifically. So we extract all the DNA and amplify the guides. And then we send it for sequencing. And from that, we do our analysis. So this is all the algorithms that we talked about. And the algorithms spit out a score and a p-value. And that allows us to filter for which genes we might be interested in. So in this case, they've chosen this gene. And you can see that it pops up on all of their different visualizations of their data. And then they went ahead and did mechanistic studies with this gene. So we'll talk about mechanism in the future. Today, I really just wanted to cover how you set up a screen, how you understand and analyze that screen. Once you get down to a few genes they're interested in, studying mechanisms is just like studying mechanisms for any project. You would do a deep dive into literature, try to understand what that gene is doing in general, and then hypothesize what it might be doing in GBM and do your experiments accordingly. We'll talk about doing that kind of experimental design and validation in the future, but today was really focused on just understanding a CRISPR gene in general. So as a review today, we looked at large scale screens. We sort of talked about how you modify gene expression in general. So we talked about transfection, transduction, plasmids, all of that stuff. And then we did a really clear walkthrough of CRISPR-Cas9 screens in general, how you set them up and how you might interpret them. As I said, we'll talk more about validation and mechanism in the future. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and feel free to follow us on Twitter to see more of this kind of material. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. So, what you uh, uncle could take now, what he said, and that could next.